Good job, 6.30. Most of you made it. That's great. And uh, good to see you here this evening. We're going to start by singing together. Take your songbook, if you will. Number 42, it's saved by the blood of the crucified one. Number 42, once you have it, let's stand together to sing. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Brother Bob. On that first together. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransom from sin. distant land she has no one to show her God's love no mother or father to wipe away the tears she cries out in the night alone bury my heart on the mission field Lord how cold to dry that young girl's tears how serves you Visions where reach their sufferings, but who will feed their empty souls? Carry my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to these suffering ones. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Lord, please bury my heart. in the night, can you hear their pleading cries, they're begging for someone to show them the way, we must go before another one dies, bury my heart on the mission field, Lord, these distant voices won't fade away. Thank you for that. Been a blessing to be here this evening, hasn't it? And I appreciate uh, Brother uh, Fennel and his uh, presentation, the message, just excellent. I love to hear the Word of God preached, amen? It's just always uh, powerful, it always speaks to the heart, and I appreciate that. And uh, I have enjoyed my time the last two days. Um, I just wish you would pray for... Uh, those of us involved in the missions conference were not being fed much, and <laughs> as you notice when I waddled up here tonight, <laughs> but uh, been wonderful. We we had uh, just incredible breakfast this morning, and then we we had some fellowship together as we went to the whistle factory and and. Uh, I said, preacher, I said, we've got to hurry up and eat lunch so we can get back by five to eat dinner. You know, so uh, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. And thank you, church. Uh, you always are so welcoming, and I appreciate that. And 
Uh, I wanted to just mention quickly, I, I travel as an evangelist. I'm in churches uh, all the time, and, and, uh, and again, a lot of churches. I, I appreciate the RU ministry in churches, um, but I just want to say to the couple visiting tonight, uh, in all the churches I travel around, I've never been in a church that does their RU ministry better than this church right here. And uh, so you're, you're fortunate. you you got a, a great program to look forward to. It's excellent. And uh, even last time, got the privilege to preach and argue uh, at that time. And so, uh, but I appreciate uh, Brother Bob's leadership in that and the church here that they just do it right. And, uh, and that's a blessing. So uh, thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. So grateful my wife could come and, uh, and be with me on the trip. Uh, folks that did not know that have wondered about my shoulder, uh, really, there's absolutely nothing wrong. I just like attention. And uh, that's part of the call of being an evangelist. You know? <laughs> no, really, I had shoulder surgery uh, three weeks ago, and uh, so they're making me wear this thing for a little while yet, and, uh, and I'm recovering fine. Uh, but anyway, I, 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 I'm looking for sympathy, and your pastor has had none for me. And... Uh, <laughs> I know if I was an Ohio State fan, he'd have sympathy. <laughs> but I'd rather go without the sympathy. <laughs> Amen, brother. My Michigan Wolverine friends back here, hey, we've we got to stick together, brother. All right, well, let's get into the Bible and, and get away from the foolishness for a while here. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I believe the message um, that the Lord's put on my heart tonight will just dovetail right in with Brother Fennel's message and and to just build upon that I hope. Second Corinthians in chapter eight. When you come to missions conference, it's it certainly deals with giving. Some people get nervous when a preacher begins to preach on giving. I like to make Baptists nervous. Amen. If you get nervous when you open the Bible and begin to look at giving, then then it ought to be a red flag to you that something's a little too important to you. We look at the Bible and see what the Bible says about giving. Whatever God says about giving is always going to be good for us. And so I want us to look at that tonight. It is, it is an incredible privilege that God allows us to have part as a co-labor with Him in winning souls across the world to Jesus Christ. What an incredible privilege. And you know, as stewards, we understand that, that we're not owners. You know, a steward's not an owner. And the problem that we get ourselves in as Christians is when we think we own. Whenever you think you're, you own, then you, you're in trouble as a Christian because the truth is God owns it all. It's all His. He can take it the next breath if He wants to. And whatever we do have has been because of God's mercy and grace and blessing and it's only given to us to manage. And really it's His. It's His for it ought to go wherever He wants it. And we're just the managers. And really in the missions conference what we want to do is we want to get our hearts in tune with the Spirit of God to lead us as our brother was talking about by faith. That He would lead us to put what He wants where He wants it. That we have responsibility over. Here in 2 Corinthians, of course, the Apostle Paul is addressing this church. He loved this church dearly. As we think about the Corinthian church, most of the time we think about this is, one of the most, this is the most carnal church mentioned in the New Testament. They were a worldly bunch. They struggled a lot. And, and yet Paul loved them dearly. And Paul had great uh, influence in, in, uh, in the church at Corinth. And, and he had to write a letter to that first uh, Corinthians that we look at, that first letter to the Corinthian church. It was a rebuking letter. He had to correct some serious problems that had crept into the church, you know. And they were, there was division. There was a bunch of carnality. Paul said, man, I want to, I want to speak to you as, as, uh, as spiritual, but I got to talk to you as carnal. You're, you're like babes in Christ. You're fussing and fighting, and that's one of the reasons we know they were Baptists. Amen. And, and so Paul had to rebuke them in that first letter. But Paul's love for them and, and, uh, and burden for them, he was concerned how they received that letter. And, and, you know, any preacher that really loves people and loves the Lord, man, he's got to preach the truth. And sometimes the truth stops on our toes. But there's no delight 
in stomping on somebody's toes. The only delight is if they are, they're willing to get their heart back into the position where God can bless them. And that's what a man of God really wants. He just wants the people to respond the way God wants them to respond. And so Paul was concerned about their response to that first letter. And we see that in chapter 7 here in, first, in 2 Corinthians. At chapter 7, in verse 4, he said, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within, within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. Paul said, I was burdened, I was concerned about how the church was doing, how they responded to the letter. Man, I was refreshed when Titus came. You see, he had sent Titus there to help work through some of their problems. And when Titus came back, Titus gave him good, uh, good report that they, they had repented and that there was grief over their sin and that they wanted to do the right thing and they loved Paul. And that refreshed Paul's heart. And I only mention that to, to mention this to you. Paul deeply loved this church and these people. And in Paul's love for the Corinthians, he understood they could never develop in their Christian lives without learning the grace of giving. And no Christian can mature and develop in their Christian life without learning the grace of giving. So he gives them here in chapter 8 a great challenge and, and a great motivation. And, and he actually instructs them for two chapters about giving, in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and we won't go through all of that. Some of you just breathed a great sigh of relief. Amen. We're just going to go through the first six verses here of chapter 8. And it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, now notice this, I bear, bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you that same grace also. You know, Christian, nothing so hinders the effect of a Christian testimony than selfishness or stinginess. And nothing so increases the effect of a Christian's testimony than unselfishness and generosity. Already it's been shared, how the, our missionaries have shared how blessed they've been by the giving of this church. That's a Christian grace, the matter of giving. The Pharisees were often used by the Lord as a negative example to the, to the uh, disciples. And he'd say, don't be like them. I mean, they're all about themselves. They're all about prestige. They're all about getting the attention. They're all about, you know, they would give their gifts so that everybody would say, wow, look how much he gave. And, you know, they would pray big, loud, flowery prayers so everybody would think they're real spiritual and all that kind of stuff. And you can mark it down. Anytime somebody wants you to think they're real spiritual, they're probably not. And the Pharisees were all about themselves. And, and, and real Bible Christianity is just the opposite of that. And so he gives these instructions. And he uses these, this, these churches of Macedonia as a, an example of the kind of churches God was pleased with in this matter of giving. So it sure is worth our time to examine what he says about these churches that the Lord was so pleased with that he had Paul use as an example of a giving church that pleased the Lord. And so we see it here. And we understand tithing uh, just proves your honesty. 
You know, tithing is not, your, your missions giving isn't tithing. You understand that, Christian? Tithing is just the beginning of the Christian life. It's giving a tenth. That's what the word means, a tenth. It's giving a tenth of your income because Leviticus tells us it, it's already the Lord's. And so for us to give tithe doesn't mean we're spiritual or, or anything else. It just means we're honest. It's already yours, Lord. You, you said the tithe is yours. I can't go and use it for myself. It's yours. And so we give it back to recognize that he is our Lord. Tithing is just proves our honesty. But giving above and beyond the tithe proves our love. And that's what he goes on to say over there in, in chapter uh, 8, verse 8. He says, I speak not by commandment, by, but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. So tithing proves our, uh, uh, proves our honesty. Giving above and beyond the tithe proves our love, our love for him. Now the tithe is already marked 10%. We know it's a tenth. That's what the word means. What we give beyond, above and beyond that, the Lord lets us get in touch with him and ask the Holy Ghost of God, what do you want me to do? And as our brother preached about faith in obedience to that, direction of the Spirit of God, we get to prove our love, giving over and above our tithe. That's where Faith Promise Missions comes in. It's a great story we read in the New Testament, in the book of John. When you recall after, uh, uh, after Lazarus was risen from the dead, and his sisters Mary and Martha, they grieved greatly when Lazarus was in the tomb. Their hearts were heavy. And when the Lord came, they were so blessed that, that the Lord took him and, 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 and put life back into him, you know. And, and they were excited about that. And shortly after that, it tells us the story how that the Lord Jesus was at the, the, the home in Bethany. And Mary was doing her usual thing. She was busy, you know, run, cumbered about with much serving. And, and, and Mary was there. And, and it says, and Lazarus, who now had been risen from the dead, was there. And the Bible tells us about Mary taking, remember that, that alabaster box of ointment. And a, 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 a box of ointment that was called spikenard. And that spikenard, the scripture tells us, was very costly. It was a, of a great savings for her to have that. And, and that, 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 uh, that spikenard was used specifically because of the, the potent fragrance of it, it was used to put on bodies when they were going to be buried so that they didn't begin to have such a foul odor from the decay right away. And they would, they would put that spikenard on those bodies. And you'll remember, if you remember that story, that when, when Mary came and broke that alabaster box and she poured over that, that ointment over her Savior, and there was one who criticized Judas. We know why he criticized. And the Lord said, hey, don't, don't criticize her. She's done what she could. She has done this for my burial. She knew the Lord was going to soon be crucified. But the amazing thing to me is to stop and realize her brother that she so loved, that she wept over and she said, oh, if only the Lord was here, Lazarus wouldn't have had to die. Why hadn't the Lord come yet? I mean, the one that she loved her brother so dearly, why didn't she use that ointment on her brother? Because she was saving it for one that she loved even more than her brother. She was saving it for her Lord. You see, giving beyond the tithe proves our love. Sometimes I wonder, as the Lord looks at us Baptists across America, I wonder how much he feels loved. And for those of us that love the Lord, and no doubt you're here on a Friday night, and you're here because you do love the Lord, and, and, and you know, most of us that love the Lord, we, we sit in a missions conference, we see the slide presentation, or now the multimedia presentations, and our hearts are moved. Something wrong if your heart's not moved. But don't you always say, man, I wish I could do so much more. I wish I could. I wish I could do so much more. Well, Paul chose to motivate the Corinthians in their giving by an example of these Macedonian churches. 
And if you'll remember uh, Philippians or uh, the, the church at Philippi, that's a Macedonian area. That was a Macedonian church. And they, it says about them that they gave once and again unto Paul. It's where we get a pattern of giving, of, uh, uh, of giving to missions. And so what an honor it would be. Wouldn't it be a great honor if the Lord would have looked down at Bible Baptist Church as a Macedonian church? What an honor. He used these churches to be an example. Well, let's look at what he says about these churches. Notice, notice first of all, the poverty. You say we're talking about giving, and here's these churches that are an example. What do you talk about poverty? I mean, don't all the, the televangelists talk about, you know, if you just give, you know, that you'll, you'll be, you know, driving your Mercedes, and you'll be living on, high on the hog, and yeah, that's all what you call a bunch of baloney. That's not what the Bible says whatsoever. God has his purpose and his will for every individual. And sometimes God wants to pour out financial riches on a person. Sometimes he doesn't. That's his business. But regardless, we all have the same principles we can live by to please the Lord. And here it tells us about these churches in verse 2, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded. Whoa, you wouldn't think if you're thinking about a church that is an example in giving that it would tell us that they live under such financial burden that they calls it and refers to it as a great trial of affliction. Have you ever been under such a financial load you feel like it's about to crush you? Well, that was these people. A great trial of affliction. Webster defines that as a state of pain or distress or grief. These were people under great financial strain, under great financial pain, under great financial grief. Their poverty, it says, abounded. The word means to prevail. Their poverty was overwhelming. They were not in the financial position to give. And you know, the Lord doesn't want us, when it comes to faith promise giving, He doesn't want us to calculate according to our budget. He wants us to get in touch with Him to find out what He wants to do through us. And here He uses this example church that was in great affliction financially. My wife and I are members of Central Baptist Church in Center, Texas. We live in Bossier City, Louisiana. It's about an hour and 20 minute drive for us to go to church when I'm home, but it's well worth it because we've got a, a pastor who's a man of God and faithful and, and church that takes a stand. And It's been a, a, a uh, missions-minded church for many, many years. Uh, Dr. Rick Martin is a, is a missionary in the Philippines that has a massive church and college and ministry there and and uh, Rick Martin was motivated by the testimony of Bob Hughes who had started a church in Manila in the Philippines back in the in the 70s I heard brother Hughes give his testimony and preach when he was dying with cancer and he had a had an oxygen you know uh, oxygen thing in his nose while he was preaching you know and and he was going to go and he and he went to be with the Lord shortly after that but he built a massive work in, in Manila in the Philippines. While he was giving his message, Rick Martin was motivated and, and burdened to go to the Philippines. And Bob Hughes, that built that great work in Manila, was from Central Baptist Church in Center, Texas, where we're members at now. Been a missions church for years. I'm guessing the church probably runs about, oh, a hundred and... 20 drive-in on Sunday morning and 60 to 80 on the buses. Good solid church, small town in Texas. But they yearly give $160,000 to missions. And honestly, we've been a member there for a while. I don't know anybody in the church that's rich. I don't know anybody in the church that, that has a big you know, business that's pouring in a lot of money. It's just they have a love for what God loves. And they give beyond what they're able to give. 
And God just keeps blessing them. And God just keeps taking care of them. But here he uses the churches of Macedonia who are in great trial of affliction financially. Man, I don't know, preacher, you know, this is good for a lot of people, but you don't know my financial position. Listen, I'm telling you, here was an example church that had great financial stress. Isn't it an amazing thing when Elijah was discouraged, you know, and the Lord fed him with that raven for a while, and then he said, all right, Elijah, go over to that, with, there's a widow there in Zarephath. And he goes to this widow in Zarephath, and God told Elijah, tell her to feed you. She said, I don't have anything. My son and I are about to eat what we got here and die. And you know what the man of God said? Feed me first. Isn't that like an evangelist? <laughs> but that's what God said to do. And do you know when she did that? She never had to worry about eating again the rest of her life. Strange, isn't it? How God uses things. Well, notice their poverty, but then notice the power. And this is the thrust of the message tonight in verse 3. It says, For to their power, I bear a record, yea, and beyond their power. I want to tell you, these folks weren't giving just to their power. But they gave beyond their power. And I want to challenge you tonight as a Christian. Consider giving beyond your ability. Consider giving what God can do beyond you. And that's the way they gave. To their power, they could see on their budget, oh, well, we can, you know, we can afford maybe $5 a week. But they gave beyond their power. These that were in great financial straits gave beyond their power. You've heard about our football camp that we do each uh, summer and Brother Woodward and I, we just finished our 24th year. Next year will be our number 25. Brother Woodward's an unusual guy, and he pastors in a little farming community, but they do, I mean, they're, they're busier than about any church I've ever seen in my life. Brother Woodward said to me one time, Brother Booth, if I'm guilty of anything, I'm probably guilty of trying to do too much. And he's probably right. But I want to tell you something. If we only attempt what looks possible, we'll never see God do the impossible. You know, it's an amazing thing. And all four Gospels mention, uh, uh, all four Gospels mention the feeding of the 5,000. But you know it's only in the Gospel of John that the little lad is mentioned who brought the fishes and loaves? You know, in Matthew, Mark, and John, it records Jesus walking on the water but only Matthew mentions Peter. Why is that? I want to tell you why tonight. Because it's not about Peter. And it's not about the little boy. It was all about what God was able to do. The focus wasn't on them. The focus was on God's ability. What God Almighty can do. And I'm telling you, our God's not lost his power. I'm telling you, his arm's not heavy, and his, his arm's not short, and his ear's not heavy. Our God can still do the miraculous if we get some Christians back to the place we just believe him. Amen. Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China, he was getting ready to speak at a large crowd in Melbourne, Australia, before he was to go back to China. He was introduced as the guest speaker in great glowing terms and they talked about all of his list of accomplishments that he had made in China and, and finally the one introducing him presented him and said now here is our illustrious guest. And Hudson Taylor walked up behind the pulpit. He stood there for a minute with his head down. Quiet. And then finally he raised his head and he looked out and he said, Dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. What God could do with Bible Baptist Church, that's beyond your power. But not beyond his power. And that's what these people gave. What's beyond our power? Look over at Ephesians chapter 3. I love this. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 20. It says, Now unto him 
that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Well, what's that power that works in you, Christian? Well, over in chapter 1 of Ephesians, it tells us in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of, of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his, own right, uh, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that raised our Lord from the dead is working in the heart of a believer according to his power. Now notice this amazing promise in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. It says that our Lord is able to do what we think, that's pretty amazing. There's some crazy things I can think. And the Lord said, he's able to do what you think. Really, Lord, I think maybe, you know, I think, Lord, so I can do that. He's able to do what you ask. And then he goes and says, but he's able to do above what you think or ask. And past that, he says, he's able to do abundantly, exceedingly, above all that we ask or think. See, they gave beyond their power. What amazing things are done when God's people are willing to trust him and get alone with God. Listen to me, this matter of faith promise giving, folks, isn't going through some motions and the mechanics that we just have a missions conference every year. This is a time to focus in and say, Dear God, you show me. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to trust you to do this year? And God will lead you to give beyond your power. Well, I think I'm about maxed out. Well, the Lord's not maxed out. As long as He's the one that's providing for you, you're not maxed out. Luke 1.37 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. So we see their poverty, the their power, and then notice verse 4, I like this. Here's the passion. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They had a passion to give. I mean, this isn't something that Paul came to them hoping that they would give. In fact, he goes on to say, this they did not as we hoped. Paul didn't come and say, he knew, boy, these, these, are, these folks are in tough shape. I mean, man, I mean, the economy's not good. A lot of them have lost their jobs. And boy, they're under a lot of stress. And Paul's heart was compassionate to them. But they begged Paul. They prayed to him. It means they pleaded with him. Paul, let us have a part. Paul, please don't turn this away. Please, Paul. Man, we saw what those missionaries, we saw those people across the world that, that they have no hope. They don't have a, a Bible in their own heart language. Paul, we saw it. We saw what they're looking in Kenya that they have no hope. Nobody's ever brought the gospel to them. They're living life without hope. Paul, please don't turn us down. Let us do this, Paul. We'll give beyond our power because they want to. Passion. See, that's beyond our tenth that we're, we give because it's His. This is out of heart of passion and love. God, let me have part in it. Man, isn't that an amazing privilege that God would let wretched, sinful creatures like you and me have part in His great work. Out a passion. There was a young man that went to Bible college, and while he was in Bible college, he had a bus route, and he picked up a little lady and her children to go to church, and, and uh, did that for a couple of years. He graduated. He went on to be a, an assistant pastor somewhere, and, and he was just there for a short time, and, and then God opened up a church back where, close to where he'd gone to Bible college, and he went back there to be the pastor, and him and his wife were just in town getting settled in, and he's the new pastor at this church, and they're out doing some shopping, and they run into this little lady. 
and her two children that they used to pick up on their bus. And that little lady says, oh, hey, how are you? She, he said, boy, good to see you. How you doing? You still riding the bus to church? Oh, she said, they quit coming to get us. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. She says, you know, we love the Lord. We love going, but they're just, we, you know, we don't have transportation. We, we live in that little place still, and, you know, we don't have much uh, preacher. And he said, well, you know, I, I just became pastor in, in the area here, and, and uh, my wife and I, we'd be delighted to come and pick you up for church. Oh, she said, would you? That's wonderful. And he said, in fact, you be ready for Sunday school Sunday morning. We'll come by and get you. And so they did. Went by and she had the kids ready and he and his wife picked her up, brought her to Sunday school. And, oh, they just loved it. Stayed Sunday morning service. And after the Sunday morning service, he was taking her back home and they're about to get out of the car at their little place. And she said to him, you know, um, preacher, you know, we, um, you know, we're, um, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're Sunday evening people too. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, we'll be back and pick you up for the evening service. Oh, would you? No, oh, she was excited, and they picked her up for the evening service. They, they took them back after the evening service, stopped, got them a little snack, and took them on to the little house where they lived. And he was in the driveway dropping her off, and as she got out, she said to the preacher, you know, um, we're Wednesday night folks too. He said, okay. He said, well, we'll be glad to come get you Wednesday night. And she started coming every service. She was so thrilled to be back in church. And one day she walked the aisle and she said, Preacher, would you let somebody like us become a member of the church? He said, I'd be delighted to have you as a member of the church. She said, well, I, I don't have a lot of talent. And, and, but she said, there's two things that I'm good at. And I, I just love to serve the Lord. She said, I'm real good... Uh, at being a grandma to little kids. And she said, and I'm a real good cook. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we need somebody to help in the nursery. You could help in the nursery and uh, our Saturday morning uh, a visitation. So one in time, we get everybody together, you could cook breakfast. And so she did. And she did that for many, many years. Until she got older. By this time, the little boy is now a deacon in the church and he teaches an adult Sunday school class. And she got to where her health was so bad that she needed round the clock care. They had to put her in a nursing home. She just needed somebody 24-7. And, but she just fought that. And she cried and she was upset. And the preacher said, listen, you know we're going to take care of you. We're going to visit you. And you know, we love you, and you're not going to be there all by yourself all the time, and, and we'll come by every week, and you know your son's here, and he loves you, he'll be there to see you. And she said, preacher, it's not that. He said, well, what are you worried about? She said, every, every month I give my $167 to the church, and I don't know how I'm going to get it there. That was her whole concern. Wouldn't that be amazing if we just had such a heart of love for our Lord? That that was our great concern. Man, they, they gave out a passion. Paul, please, let us have a part in it. And then I want you to see the priority. Look at verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. First, and that's where it's all got to start. You see, this isn't something that's just calculated. This is the Lord's work. And first, we have to give ourselves to the Lord. First, we have to die to self. First, we have to say, Lord, it's not about me. It's what you want. Now, that doesn't make sense to anybody if you're not saved. If you've never come to the Lord and admitted you were a sinner deserving of hell, which all of us are. If you've never come and said, Lord, I, I know I'm worth worthy of hell. I, I know I deserve it, Lord. I've, I've been wretched and wicked. And you've never accepted that Jesus, when he died at Calvary, died for your sin and say, Lord, I need you to forgive me. I want you in, into my heart and my life and trust Christ as your Savior. If that's never happened, you've never been saved, none of this matters to you. None of it makes any sense. See, you first have to give yourself to the Lord. 
And then those of us who are saved have to come to that place where we say, okay, it's not about me being the priority, Lord, it's about you. What do you want, Lord? What is it you want me to give? And then they gave according to the will of God. It was their priority. You see, nobody can know the will of God until your own will is buried. It's true of every one of us. When I was a teenager, I grew up in California. It's okay, I got over it. Now, I remember hearing testimony of evangelist Phil Schuler. I don't know if he's still living. I don't know if he's with the Lord now. If he's not with the Lord, he's old. But I remember him giving his testimony and absolutely amazing. His daddy was fighting Bob Schuler. They wrote books about him. And he was an old-time Methodist, but he was a Bible preacher. And he ended up becoming Baptist later on in his life. But oh, fighting Bob Schuler, man, when he first started, he was, he was pastoring in, in Texas. And he was in a town. He found out about the mayor was running around on, on his wife. And man, he just made, he put it in the, in the newspaper, going to expose the mayor's sin Sunday. <laughs> well, he had a crowd. But he just, man, he didn't, Hold back nothing. He preached on sin. I mean, he just let her. Well, he stirred up such a, a, a challenge. I mean, there were people getting saved. The church was growing. But, it, boy, there were so much, many battles going on. The Methodist uh, convention just said, hey, listen, we need to move him somewhere else. So they did. They, they reassigned him somewhere else. Well, if we went there and the same thing happened. They said, let's get him out of Texas. So they sent him out to Los Angeles and said, there's enough people out there, nobody will he ever hear about him. Well, he got out there, he wasn't out there, but just a, a couple of weeks, and there was a lady who had followed his ministry all along, who was very, very wealthy. And she called him and she said, uh, Bob Schuler, you don't know me, but I have followed your ministry, and I'm thankful for a man of God who's not afraid to tell the truth. And I want you to know, I just bought a radio station in Los Angeles, and I'm giving it to you for two, $2. So he got on the radio. Well, you can imagine what happened. And I mean, the church just began to be flooded with people, but there were people getting saved right and left, and church just exploded. Well, all during that time, there were those that hated Bob Schuler. And uh, newspaper tycoons that began to run articles against him and all kinds of things. And, and the, the, the notorious gangster in, in Chicago um, I always forget his name, Al Capone. Al Capone um, put out a, a, a hit on Bob Schuler. I forget how many thousand dollars he sent men out there that came out to his farm where he, where he lived in, in California tried to kill him. God didn't let it happen. But that was Phil Schuler's daddy. And Phil, when he was about four years old, he and his brother were goofing off in the hayloft in the barn and he fell out on his head and he went unconscious into a coma and when he came out of it he had some kind of damage in his brain that he could not speak anything that would come out would just be a squeak but he couldn't even make a word out of anything from four years old he went on to to kindergarten at five and his mother had to pin a little note on his lapel saying don't ask Phil any questions audibly. He cannot speak. Please don't embarrass him. Well, he got on the bus, and as soon as he got on the bus, other kids saw that note, and they started making fun of him. So he took the note off and stuck it in his pocket. Well, first class, he's, he's in class with his teacher, and the teacher's going around from desk to desk asking kids to stand up, give their name, and what their address was. When they got to Phil, he couldn't talk. He wrote on a little piece of paper he kept, I can't talk. Well, the boy behind him started laughing at him and making fun of him, so he did what any good young man would do. He turned around and punched him. <laughs> and from that day on, he was in fights every day, and he was in trouble constantly. And his testimony was that he just got so bitter and angry. You know, he couldn't talk. People made fun of him. He was just in fights all the time, and he was a big kid. I believe he was about 14, if I remember the testimony right. 
His older brother was a youth pastor, and he was a dynamic young preacher, and, and he was holding a big youth rally, and, and Phil was sitting there, and, and, and Phil's daddy was on the platform, and his brother was preaching, and, and his br brother was preaching that God put something in your heart. God Almighty is powerful enough to do it. You can trust whatever God needs you to do. Well, Phil immediately got up, and he walked down the aisle, and his brother stopped, and he walked down and said, What are you doing? He wrote on his paper, I'm surrendering to preach. He had not spoken a word since four years old. His brother said, Phil, maybe you can work on the buses or something. You can't preach. You can't talk. He just pointed the paper. I'm surrendering to preach. He went back up on the platform. His dad said, what's going on with your brother? He said, Dad, he's saying that he's called to preach. He said, you get down there and tell, tell him to get away from that nonsense. You got him in this mess. You get him out of this mess. <laughs> they went home that night. Phil said he went to his bedroom brokenhearted. His dad was mad. He said he'd never ever heard his mother speak against his dad for anything. But his bedroom was right next to mom and dad's and he said he could hear them going on. And she said, what is your problem? He said, it's your son that can't even talk. He's going to embarrass me. It'll be in the newspaper. He said, he's called to preach. They're going to make a big mockery out of this whole thing. And his wife said to him, oh, really? Great Dr. Bob Shuler, fighting Bob Shuler. You preach all the time that God Almighty is capable of doing anything. That God Almighty can do, if God puts it in your heart, God can do it. And now you can't even trust that God can help your son to preach. Phil said he laid on his bed and wept. The next day his daddy apologized to him. Within a week he got a phone call. And uh, his dad said, hey, it's somebody wants to talk to you. Well, he couldn't talk, but he put the receiver up to his ear and the guy said, listen, we heard that you, you surrendered to be a preacher. We're having a youth rally next week on Saturday night. We'd like you to preach. Can you preach? He said, mm-hmm. And he hung up. Ask his dad, wrote down, you've got to help me get a sermon together. His dad said, well, okay. So he helped him get a sermon written. Phil memorized the sermon. And he hadn't spoken a word since he was four years old. And he got up in front of that crowd of teenagers. He said, when I opened my mouth, he said, it wasn't very pretty. But he said, sound came out and I could form a word. And he said, I went through, after a few minutes, it got better and it got better. And he said, and I went through all that I had memorized my dad's sermon in about ten minutes. And he said, and then I just went on and preached for another thirty. When I was a teenager, he had been preaching about thirty years at that point. There's a God that's far more powerful than us. We can give beyond our power. If we'll just get in tune with Him and say, Dear Lord, You put on my heart what You want. By faith, I'll trust You. I'm not talking about some emotional decision. I'm not talking about some crazy nonsense. I'm just saying, when God makes it clear to your heart what He wants you to do, He's more than able to do it. What incredible churches, Macedonian churches. Wouldn't that be something if God would have looked down at Bible Baptist Church and say, hey, there's a, another Macedonian church. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. We need you, Lord. And Father, we confess that, Lord, in and of ourselves, we're absolutely nothing. And we know, Lord, you're a mighty and powerful God, and with you there's nothing that's impossible. I pray that you would help, Lord, as the folks in Bible Baptist Church consider your will for them in this matter of giving to missions for this coming year. I pray, God, would you make it clear in hearts. Would you help them first to give themselves to thee? Maybe there's some tonight that need to come to the altar and say the truth is, Lord, I've had so many other things that have cluttered my priorities, Lord, that you've not been the priority. 
Maybe some that need to just come tonight and say, Dear Lord, I want to first give myself to Thee. Maybe there's some here tonight, Lord, if they died right now, they're not sure they'd go to heaven. Not sure they're saved. Would you draw their hearts to come that we can show them from the Bible how to trust Christ tonight? May many of us just come and say, Dear Lord, I need your direction. Help me to trust you to give beyond my power. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm asking you tonight, can you say, Brother Booth, thank God I'm saved. I can take you to the place where I remember that I knew I was a sinner on my way to hell and deserving of it. And somebody took the Bible and showed me from the Bible how to trust Christ. And with a repentant heart, I called on the Lord and asked Him to forgive and save me. Brother Booth, if I died right now, I'm 100% sure I'd go to heaven. If that's your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? Just raise it up and put it down and be honest about it. Thank you. I didn't do that to embarrass anybody. I want you to just be honest with the Lord tonight. And I wonder how many would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved on my way to the heaven, but I needed that tonight. The Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight as a Christian. Some things I need to get in order with the Lord. Pray for me. God's speaking to my heart tonight as a Christian. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart tonight. God bless your hearts. Thank you for your tenderness. Maybe there's others. Maybe something I didn't mention and the Lord's dealing with you about it. Include me in the prayer. The Holy Spirit's dealing with me as well. Include me in the prayer tonight. Just slip your hand up and put it down. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. I wonder tonight who would say, to be honest with you, Brother Booth, if I died right this minute, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. If I could really be sure, according to the Bible, that I was forgiven, saved, and on my way to heaven, I'd like to know that for sure. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Just put it up and put it down right where you're at. I won't embarrass you. I would like to be your friend and pray for you if you'd let me. Now that's me. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know it if I could. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up and put it down. In just a moment, we're going to stand. After we stand, I'll pray. God's spoken to your heart when the music plays. God's dealt with your heart. Let's find a place at the altar, whether you raised your hand or you didn't. You, maybe some of you just need to come and say, Dear Lord, show me. Lord, I want to be willing. I want to trust you. Show me, Lord. Maybe some need to come and confess some things that you know God's not pleased with. If you stood before him right now, you know that things aren't right. And maybe some need to come and just let the preacher know, man, I need to be saved. Let's do what the Lord wants us to do. Would you stand with me for prayer, please? Again, Father, we love you. We thank you for the time we've had tonight to look at your precious word. We thank you for the challenge and encouragement about faith, Lord, and and then the, the wonderful challenge we see, Lord, as we look at those Macedonian churches. God, help us to be those kind of Christians. Lord, you told us without faith it's impossible to please you. Help us to be pleasing Christians. And then those that are here, Lord, not sure they're going to heaven. Lord, would you open their hearts and draw their hearts and give them the courage to come now, Lord, to allow us to show them from the Bible how they could get that settled by trusting Christ tonight. So do your work, we pray, in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart. You need to come. Why don't you come right now? Music is playing. God's dealt with your heart. Come on. You raised your hand. God dealing with you. Why don't you come right now, would you? you're not sure that you're saved or on your way to heaven I want to tell you something 39 years in the ministry I've never met one person on their deathbed that regretted that they gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ never met one the multitudes of sad stories of those that stayed in the devil's trap and never found the freedom in Jesus Christ you don't have to be embarrassed here. You're among a crowd of people that love to see you trust Christ.
Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the message from your word tonight. Sure, it's been good to be in church this evening. Lord, you've helped us. You've challenged us from your word. You've convicted us. And Lord, I'm asking now that each of us would be doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't let us hear. And you've, we, we've looked in the mirror of your word and seen what, what we are and we've seen what changes need to be made. And Lord, don't let us walk away and, without asking you to make those changes in our lives. Lord, we want to be obedient to what you tell us to do. And so, Father, I pray we'll take the messages to our heart tonight and we'll allow you to work them in us and work through us, please. That which is well-pleasing in your sight. We want to please you in all we do. Thank you for each one that's here this evening, Lord. We pray you'll bless the remainder of the night for the RU group, the fellowship that the church will have with the missionaries. Uh, give us the rest we need tonight, Lord, and I pray it'll be a great day tomorrow. We're praying, Lord, as we go through the parade and we give out the gospel. And we try to be a, a blessing and encouragement to those in our community that, Lord, uh, you'll touch the hearts of people who receive the gospel tomorrow. And, Lord, may it find uh, seed in some hearts that are good ground, and it'll bring forth fruit. So, Lord, dismiss us with your care now, and bless the RU Fellowship to follow. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, listen carefully. We're going to, uh, those of you who need to get the gifts for the missionaries tonight, I want you to slip out and go get those. Missionaries, we'll have you slip out and go to your uh, conference room, as we usually do. And then folks, go right down the stairs, and you can meet with them in the conference room at their table and get a chance to talk with them and get to know them a little bit. Um, we're going to let you go ahead and slip out, and then we're going to let the RU folks go to the fellowship hall. Brother Bob, you can go ahead and go if you want, and uh, that way you can be over there and organize those folks and get them uh, started on what we need to get started on for their uh, second, second talk. All right. Thank you, RU, for being here tonight. Appreciate it so much, and uh, you did a great job and uh, a little different for us this evening. There goes Brother Bob. All right. All right, all you folks, go ahead and you slip out if you want to, and uh, that way we'll get you over there before you get caught up in, in the crowd with everybody else. That a great group, are you? Amen. Wonderful. All right, we should have all the singers left. <laughs> We're going to sing, all right? Uh, the back of the bulletin there. It's 39 in the hymn book, I think, if you need that. And um, take my life and let it be first, first stanza and last stanza of take my life and let it be, all right? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. love at the impulse of thy love on the last take my love my God I pour its treasure store let with me ever only all for thee ever God bless you. You are dismissed.